Hi and welcome to the signal pad. In this episode I've got another repair here. We have an Agilent E36468. This is a very classic power supply. A pretty good one. Uh, it goes up to 8 volts 3 amps or 20 volts 1.5 amps. Two totally in independent channels. Of course you would find these everywhere and they come in several different models and I would think that this is a fairly popular one. And if you of course want to make a negative voltage you just connect a positive and a negative together and you'll have a negative supply because these are totally floating. Now these are linear power supplies, they're not switching, laboratory grade, ultra low noise and fairly reliable. So now the question is uh, what's wrong with this one? Well let's turn it on and see what happens. Here we go, it's got a nice bright VFD which is good, doesn't have uh, too much hours on it. So channel 1, channel 2 can be selected, we can turn it on and we can see it does say 0 volts. Now if I go on to channel 2, I can increase the voltage and this is a live readout of the actual voltage that's apparently being shown on the terminal. So if you go to display limit, you can see what it's actually set to, voltage and maximum current. And if you press it again, you see what's actually going on. Now if I go to channel 1, if I turn this, you can see absolutely nothing happens even though I hear the clicks. If I go under display limit, you can see that we are indeed setting that. So the setting seems to work, which means everything else is working, the processor, the, the knob and everything is okay, but of course nothing is being displayed. So something has gone wrong there. Now this has two independent channels and they're identical. That often helps with debugging when you have two identical channels. Now let's see if the m voltage measurement of this port is actually working or not. So if I go into channel two, let's set channel two to zero, and let's go to uh, display limit and let's channel one also to zero. So we go back and forth, they're both set to zero. And let's go ahead and connect a cable across from channel two to channel, ba channel one. We're basically going to feed voltage from the second channel back onto the first channel. And this is okay, of course, this supply can take that. And it should display the voltage that's being pushed into this port if the measurement circuitry is working. So that's a really quick, easy test to see if things are okay. So let's go to channel one and let's set it to three volts and let's go to channel, uh, channel two, channel one and you can see it's reading three volts. If I disconnect that, you can see that it will read zero volts. And if I go back to here, if I go to channel two, we can see we're syncing about 10 milliamp. If I remove that, what do I get? Maybe I have a one milliamp. So it does sync some current, which is to be expected. We are pushing voltage back into the power supply. So indeed something's wrong with channel one, but channel two seems to be working and the back feed voltage does display the voltage so quite a bit of channel one is working. So what could have gone wrong? Well there's a several possibilities, maybe the output driver transistors are dead, uh, maybe the DAC that's setting the voltage isn't working. Either way we're going to have to take it apart and take a look at it. We do have the schematic of this power supply, that's going to be pretty helpful so we can go ahead and debug that and see if we can figure out the problem. So one step at a time, let's take it apart, see what it looks like. And here's a look inside of this power supply. Now I don't see anything unusual right off the bat. We find all the normal components we expect to see. There's a very large transformer here that makes up almost about 75-80% of the weight of the whole unit. This really large transformer is of course required because this is a linear power supply, not a switching one. And this is a really custom. You can see it has even a part number of this model on it, even though they make many different models. So there's going to be custom versions of these. And these are impossible to find. If something's working with this, forget it. You cannot find a replacement for these. It's very hard to find one of these. But the construction is kind of obviously what we would expect to get. You have a main PCB at the bottom that has all the power transistors and analog functions on it. And there's a digital board up here. And the digital board is going to have processors and GPIB and serial control on it, as well as the cable that is used to control the front panel VFD. Now we've seen these VFDs in some of my other videos. These things actually have their own little processor on there as well. So they're pretty fairly complicated structure. There's a, a serial interface between the two things and it all works together nicely. So if you don't have an you have a screen, it may not necessarily mean that the, the, the main uh, processor on this unit is bad. It could just be the processor on the front panel here. So everything else kind of makes sense. I don't see anything obviously weird. So we're going to have to do it, dedicate our t some time to figure out what's going on. Now, this is complicated. There's a lot of stuff going on. But in principle, we should be able to know how it works, at least from a really abstract level. We have a transformer. This is going to produce a voltage higher than an AC voltage somewhere higher than the maximum DC voltage this power supply can give you because that's the only way you're going to be able to linearly regulate this down to an output voltage that you want. So let's just assume that this guy puts out an AC voltage of let's say 20 volts and then they're going to rectify that 
and it's going to create a clean DC voltage. And then they're going to use some kind of a voltage regulator, adjustable voltage regulator scheme with some controllable uh, circuitry around to be able to generate the DC voltages that you want on two separate channels. So they have transformer turns that are going to be isolated from each other and controlled by some transistors. So in principle, pooch, get your tail out of here. So in principle, what we essentially have is a variable voltage regulator. Now, there's a lot more going on, of course, because this thing has over voltage protection, over current protection, over temperature protection. It has constant current mode, constant voltage mode. It has slew rate control, on and off mode. There's a lot of stuff happening. So it's going to be more complicated than what I said. But the principle is essentially that, which means that if one of the channels isn't working, the best place to look for it is either start from the output and work our way all the way down until we get to the DAC that sets the output voltage, or the other way around. We find the digital section and we move forward. Both of those are fine. Since one channel is working, we can use it as a reference for our measurements. So let's go to the schematic and take a look and see what the schematic is saying and see if we can identify the components I just talked about, and then we can do some measurements on this unit directly. Okay, so now that we have a good idea of kind of how the instrument works, we can decide whether we should analyze the schematic starting from the output channels all the way backwards, or do we start from the digital side and move forward? Now, since we know there's going to be a digital side, why don't we start from a digital, because that's easy to find and we can then follow the voltages. So what do we have here? Here we have all the components at the top of the main analog board. This is placement, so we don't care about that right now. This is the bottom, all the surface mount components are there. Here's the circuitry for channel one. There we go. So we're not going to look at this right now. We're going to work our way backwards, as I said, and channel one is, is a defective channel. Channel two is the working channel. We keep going. And what do we have? The isolation circuit, forget about that right now. Uh, AC input and bias supply, this stuff is probably working. If this stuff had any issue, then you wouldn't have one of the channels working. And this is where you have, obviously, the input transformer and the full bridge rectifier and so on. So let's keep going further. That's the digital board. We're getting closer. Let me see, what is on the digital board here? What do we have? Oh, did I just skip a page? Oh, it doesn't matter anyway. Here it is. Here's the goal. There's our A to D converter, and here's our D to A converter. So the D to A converter is what, what we're interested in. The circuitry over here is responsible for doing what I described, which is setting the reference voltages for constant current, constant voltage setting on both of the channels. So let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit. And so I can get a good view. I, I may have zoomed in too much. Let's go back out a little bit and look over here to see what we have. There we go, that's becoming a little more clear. So now, if I go ahead and start labeling these a little bit. So here's our main DAC. You can see the main DAC here. This is a serially fed DAC, so the data is coming in serially. You can see clock, latch, and data coming in. That's coming from the processor. So we can don't have to worry about that. There's some digital muxing here. Forget about that, that doesn't matter. What matters is that it has an analog output. We can follow the analog output. This is a single channel DAC. And they send that to an analog MUX. The MC74HC4051D is an analog switch MUX, meaning that depending on the digital settings you give it on these lines, it's going to reroute this analog voltage to one of these eight outputs. So all it is is an analog switch. And the reason they do this is because they don't want to put eight DACs to generate eight analog voltages because these voltages don't change very fast. So if you multiplex the DAC output, between eight channels, you can set eight different analog values and store them in a capacitor and then switch between them rapidly to refresh them as needed. Kind of like a DRAM cell except purely analog. So we can now follow all of these eight channels. So these eight channels go right and they have to be buffered and stored in some capacitors and that's exactly what we find here. So let's go ahead and follow that a little bit more. There it is, there's, there's, there's a storage places. You can see the analog voltage are sampled with these RC capacitors, there's some filtering and some storage, and then they go into the input of op amps, which has very high impedance, and therefore they won't discharge. Interestingly enough, there's actually a typo here. I just noticed that R5 says 21.5K, whereas all the other ones are 215. So the, either the 215 ones are supposed to be 21.5K or the 21.5K is supposed to be 215. So there's something wrong there. But if you look at this, all of these buffered voltages, there's also more of them here. There you go, they're all 215. And there's a dummy one that's not used. So here we have constant voltage reference one, constant current reference one, constant voltage reference two, 
constant current reference to and then over voltage protection one and over voltage protection two. This means that this single DAC using this multiplexed output can set all of these voltages which control different aspects of the power supply as indicated here. So if we know one of the channels is working and it does work, it means that all of these circuits are basically working. The only unknown is potentially one of these um, op amps aren't working. So if the CV is not working, for example, if this op amp is dead, then obviously we're not going to get any voltage at the output. But this is fairly unlikely because so U25 is all of these devices, which means that they're all on the same package. This is a monolithic circuit. So it's a little unlikely that all the op amps are working except one in the same package. Same here. These are also in the same package. Uh, they're on the same device and there's just a quad op amp uh, surface mount component. So I'm a little bit reluctant to think that these op amps have died in any way because half of them are working. So I don't think that's the problem really. So let's Anyway, what we can measure. So what we can measure is we can go to P5 and P4. These are connectors, which we should be able to find on directly on the PCB. And we can measure these voltages and change the voltage setting of the power supply, put a multimeter on it. And if the voltage setting changes these voltages, it means that these circuits are all working. So that's kind of the beginning of the test in the digital domain. Then we can work our way backwards also from the analog domain. So let's go to the non-working channel which I think, I think it was channel one. This has now been a day since I talked about it from the beginning of the video, but I think it's channel one, but it doesn't matter. The principle applies. So let's go back until we find channel one. Uh, this is still not what I'm looking for. I know I'm zoomed in too much, but that's okay. Okay, no, we gotta keep going back. There you go, so that's some other stuff which we don't need. Let me see, what are we, is this channel one? Uh, this is channel two and here is channel one. So what do we expect to see on channel one? Well, let's find the connector, which is the output. And that's this very thick line here. And we keep going, there it is. Here's out one, that is positive output. Remember, these are floating different, these are floating circuits, uh, sections of the circuit. Channel one and channel two do not share the same common grounds. So when you make measurements on these channels, you have to have your reference with respect to each channel separately on the multimeter or oscilloscope, whatever you're going to be using. So we have to be careful with that. So here's a positive output, where's the negative output? And here's a negative output. There it is, out negative at the bottom here, right here. Okay, so let's start with the positive. And we expect to see a transistor. There has to be one main transistor the output positive is, is going through. And then you change the voltage of that transistor and it's in some complex feedback to stabilize the voltage, just like a voltage regulator would. So we have to find that. And there should be some sense resistors and we can actually already see that. There's some sense resistors here. So here's the path of the current. Here you got all protection circuitry of various kinds, some smoothing capacitance. And we follow this guy. Where does it go? It should hit the transistor at some point. I certainly hope so. There it is. I see it. And we go this way and this way and this way. And here's our transistor. So could it be that the transistor is dead? Yeah, of course. That's one possibility. Now it's a little, it would be a little bit unusual for the transistor to be dead and become a complete open. Because remember, I applied voltage to the output from another channel and I could measure the voltage, meaning that this is not a short circuit, otherwise we would have shorted the other channel. So there is definitely something going on. Oop, I don't want to move that. What is it doing? No. Go back. There it is. So now let's follow what is controlling the gate of this transistor. Well, there's some resistors, that's to be expected, some filtering. And then there is a diode in here, a bunch of places it taps off to. And then there is another amp, op amp circuitry here. And then it goes and check it out. CV reference one. There it is. That's exactly the node that the DAC sets. And you can see that the negative reference voltage is passed, that the reference voltage of the DAC is also passed to this board. So now it all makes sense. The DAC voltage actually comes over here and goes into this transistor. Now anything from the DAC up into this transistor could be faulty. So we have to go and make measurements. Now some really easy places to measure as immediate places to look is we can measure the gate voltage of this transistor. If that gate voltage is not changing when we set the voltage, that means the voltage from the DAC is not reaching here. Or we go to the DAC and we measure the voltage of the DAC directly. Does that voltage change as we change the setting of the voltage? If both of those things are working, then the problem is somewhere in between. 
but it's likely that one of those two nodes is not working and that's the reason why that we have this issue remember the problem here is very specific we get no change in the output voltage but the output voltage can be monitored there is no short there's no cv cc being triggered on the power supply it doesn't seem to be drawing any extra current so it is just not producing a voltage so we should be able to go and figure it out now having said that and i hope that you're still here listening to me let's go back to the power supply and do some of these basic measurements and this should answer a lot of the questions okay so here we go we can, let's give it a try and try to check to see if the DAC is working which is the easiest part to try so the circuitry over here is the DAC and all of the op amps I just showed you so we should be able to go ahead and measure this now I've already turned the power supply on so you got to be pretty careful with that and I can change the setting of the voltage of channel 2 which is a working channel here and monitor the DAC voltage that's the one we know is working let me turn this on as well. Let's go ahead and give it a try. So we're looking at pin 7 of U25. That's channel 2's constant voltage reference. So here's U25. Here's pin 7. Okay, let's increase the voltage and see what happens. There we go. You can see I can change the voltage out of the DAC, and this is to be expected. That's exactly what we would want to see, and it's working. So that's normal. Now let's go ahead and check pin number one of U25, that's the constant voltage setting of channel one, the channel that is defective. So pin number one is over here, put that in there, and let's go ahead and select channel one here of the power supply, and let's increase that voltage, and no, it's also working, no, no problem. So actually I was turning it the other way, that's why it was already at zero. So it seems to be working without any issues. So the DAC is working on both channels, and that's what we were expecting to find out. It means that the op amps and the DAC are functioning on both the channel one and channel two, because I can change them by changing the voltage, even though no voltage is being produced out of the power supply itself. So now those voltages are passed to this connector, and this connector pushes them down to the analog board. So what we can do is we can switch the, this, this whole thing upside down and look at the input to the transistor that controls the output of channel 1 and the transistor that controls the output of channel 2 and see if these voltages are present on that gate as well. Make sure the gate of that transistor is also switching around. And we're going to apply the same methodology to the output transistors of the two channels which are most easily accessible from the bottom side of the board. So we have two transistors we need to check. Q108 is on channel 2 and Q109 is on channel 1. So let's again check the working channel. So I have channel 2 selected right now on the power supply and I'm going to connect this to pin number 1 and I'm going to change the output voltage and it should change the gate voltage. There you go. That's exactly what you would expect. The gate voltage is changing. That's promising. Let's move now the ground reference to channel 1 which is a non-working channel. Select channel 1 on the power supply, go to transistor Q109 on the gate of Q109 and change this voltage and oh look at that, that does not change. Now that's interesting, the gate voltage doesn't change which means the DAC voltage is not reaching the gate voltage. That's surprising. Let's double check to make sure that the gate voltage is actually present on this board, this connector P105 over here, that's the connector where the voltages are passed down. And I'm looking at the schematic here, and it says pin number 1 on the connector 105 is the constant voltage of channel 1. Pin number 1, that's this pin. So if I change the voltage, okay, so it is working here. So you can see the voltage reaches here, but it does not reach here from here to here. And there's, of course, an op amp and other stuff in the way. So we have to trace this and find out where between this connector, one op amp, a bunch of resistors, a diode, and the gate of this is the problem. So we've already narrowed it down significantly. We just have to find out what is happening for this voltage from here to here that makes it not reach the gate of Q109. Well, let me poke around a little bit, see if I can come to any conclusions. Okay, so here is something really, really strange that I just discovered. That's a uh, and it's certainly an unusual problem. So here's a resistor, this resistor over here, this one right there, this is R399, I believe. This one, the, this, this voltage that I was talking about goes through that resistor. So here is one side of the resistor. Hold on, I have to look at it 
there you go we're going to touch one side of the resistor we're touching touching a pad on the pcb which is connected to it i'm going to change the voltage and you can see the voltage changes which is exactly what we expect to come from that now we're going to go to this one and there's no voltage so there's a trace across this resistor but on one side of it i measure the voltage on the other side of it on the resistor itself i measure the voltage but on the trace of the pcb i don't measure the voltage now that is strange it means that this resistor is not connected to the pad that's underneath it it's just floating above it but this power supply was working before which means that at some point it must have been working which means this connection must have been very very bad a cold solder joint that's basically not visible at all i'm going to zoom in really closely so you can see but we have voltage on this on this pad on this pad but not that on this pad so now let's go and take a close look at the resistor and see if we can actually find out if that connection is missing and if this is the only problem that's a great find because that would hopefully fix the power supply completely let's take a close look at it well here's a suspect area i need a macro lens i i don't have one for this camera but yeah this is, seems to be not connected because i can measure the voltage here here but not here so yeah interesting so well let's go ahead and do a quick soldering on this and re reflow this basically with a little bit of flux and even though these ones even don't look that good maybe i just touch them up all at the same time and i've been scratching this area with the tip of this probe okay let's go touch it up see what happens okay a little bit of flux in this area that should be good enough and we will just touch it up a little bit you have to make sure that i don't i'm in a really awkward angle here but let's see where was it there we go just gonna touch it up a little bit touch this one too and this one too might as well touch the other side as well i think this is i hope this is connected now by this now by this point okay well let's give it a try all right let's give it a try i'm very eager to see what happens so he's turned on already so here's channel two should be working there you go it works and channel one haha -ha, there it is look at that now i can control the output it is now working which is fantastic well at least it's showing something i think what we should do is uh, hook it up to a multimeter to make sure that it's actually producing the correct outputs and then i think then it's a working unit well if we're going to test this why don't we just go all out and test it with an eight and a half digit multimeter since we have it right over here so i'm going to go ahead and zoom here since that's the display that really matters actually maybe just just a vfd is probably good enough and we can Go ahead and try something. So this is channel one, the channel that wasn't working. Right now set to zero volts. You can see it's almost at zero. Let's go one volt and 1.002 and the display says 1.00. That's pretty good. Let's go all the way to eight. 8.00 is looking good. Let's go on the high side and go to 10 volts. There it is, still good. This is pretty good actually. Let's go all the way to 20 volts. Here it is, 20.01 and the display says 20.02. So I have to say, looks like that channel is definitely functional we can do exactly the same thing for the other channel as well it's not difficult here he goes channel two and it's set to zero volts here's one volt oh it's a little different huh? it's a little lower but it's also pretty close let's go to eight volts display is reading 7.99 and the voltage is 7.99 so that is good we can go high and let's go all the way to 20 it's reading 19.97 and it's 19.97 so i have to say it's pretty good i'm happy with that now you may ask is the current working or not well that should be easy to test as well okay here i've set the power supply to limit itself to half an amp and you can see that we're measuring 0 0.501 and this is reading 0 0.5002 so it's okay it's a little bit off but doesn't really matter and we can try exactly the same thing on channel one as well and you should also read half an amp and 
half an app. There you go, perfect. So it is really working very well on both channels, channel one and channel two. So I have to say, I think this is a successful repair and I hope you enjoyed this and the analysis of the schematic. Again, the reason I can do these is because of my Patreon supporters that allows me to purchase these things and play around with them. I really am very grateful. There's a whole bunch of other equipment I have purchased and they're just waiting in a queue for repair. Lots of different diverse equipment ranging from uh, synthesizers, optical, uh, wavelength meters, other kind of power supplies, and a whole bunch of other really cool things. So again, thank you so much, and I'll see you in the comment section.